Okay, it's recording. You want me to go ahead and go live? Yep. It's preparing now. Okay, are you seeing full screen? I am. It says objective. I want to reach a broader audience. I want to engage with my viewers. I want to build a community. What's my option? Hold on. Let's let's re turn our the recording off. We don't need to do it right now. Send to now recording. Hmm. Okay, now it's counting down again. It stopped counting down for a minute, so. I think we are going. Hopefully everybody will be able to join us soon. And it is showing on Facebook Live. I'm able to see it. And we've got two watching on Facebook Live. Welcome.
I think my clock must have started some or stopped somewhere because it's getting really close to six o'clock and time to get started. Yes, I have six o'clock on the dot. I believe our counter was off last month too. I think it resets itself. It must do it. All right. Well, since it is six o'clock, we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone. I'm Dr. Paula Davis. I'm the Bay County 4-H agent and state military liaison uh, working in 4-H youth development. And my co-presenter tonight, I'll let her introduce herself and kick off our presentation. Good evening, everyone. I'm Nikki Crossan. I am the 4-H agent in Holmes County. I'm so glad to have everyone here this evening join us and we will go ahead and get started. So for this evening, um, our goals are quite simple, although we have um, quite a lot of information to share with you this evening. Um, so starting, uh, we would like to have everyone, uh, all of our volunteers and participants to um, completely understand the 4-H club year cycle. So we have a lot of information regarding that. And then we're going to delve into the club roles and responsibilities that our volunteers and um, those that assist in the clubs have. So we're gonna to touch base on those. And then we have some wonderful strategies for uh, organization and time management that will help um, with maybe some of the stress um, all of us feel every once in a while in trying to get our clubs organized. So we're going to assist you with some great tools on how to better uh, manage your time in uh, club management. And then you can utilize those in your, in your own personal and professional lives. And we have um, some great resources on our Northwest Florida volunteer page that we're going to share with you. So um, we have a lot lined up for this evening. And with that, um, we have uh, some of us may ask, well, why is organization uh, so important? I feel like I have a great handle on being organized. I feel like I manage my time well, or you know, it's just overrated to be organized. I'm doing just fine. Well, we want to uh, stress the importance of being organized and managing our time properly, because if you, if you do manage your time and you're organized, it offers structure and planning and balance. And when you have all of that in alignment, then you um, increase your productivity. So when you increase your productivity, you are offering uh, personal growth and you have um, much better success at what you're accomplishing. So when you have all of that, then you are demonstrating all of that wonderful growth and success to your 4-H members there in your club. So again, we learn by doing and we demonstrate that to others and our youth are watching. So when we have that in our clubs, then our youth are able to implement that in their own lives. So we believe organization and time management is extremely important. So what are the club roles? Um, we all know, uh, we're very familiar with our club. Uh, and sometimes we tend to forget that there are a lot of volunteer roles we have in our 4-H pro programs. Uh, we're usually familiar with the first two. We have our club leaders, we have our activity leaders. Our club leaders are those that um, are our primaries that we usually have, and they contribute to the success of the clubs. Um, they provide the organizational leadership. And we have those that are our activity leaders and they are just what the title says. They lead those activities. They're very success, uh, uh, successful in getting those activities done within the club. And we usually talk about those quite frequently. However, we do have a lot more roles in the volunteer realm that you could utilize in your clubs. And we want to emphasize that, again, uh, some of time management is to delegate. And that can be very difficult at times for us to learn to let go of some of those tasks and delegate. So when you have uh, more awareness of the roles that are available, such as those 4-H uh, event judges and the project leaders and uh, even those chaperones, you can delegate more and get even more uh, success within your clubs. So in order to dive into these volunteer club roles, we have those on our Northwest Florida uh, 4-H volunteer website and Paula is going to drop those in the chat. Paula or Jen will drop those in the chat. We want to emphasize that web page once again 
And there's a short video clip um, that has been put together by our district team. It's a wonderful video clip that really gets to the point and the service roles, the service descriptions that go into great detail on each volunteer role of those are listed as well. It's a great resource tool for you. Paula? I forgot to unmute. <laughs> so now we're gonna move on to planning and goal setting. And um, one of the first things that I'm gonna share with you are some resources that you can use with your clubs. There is a 4-H club planning workbook and a 4-H officer's handbook. Both are found at our military partnership site um, that you can download and work through. And we're gonna show you some of the different parts of those things, both of those items. So to start out, we are um, going to do some club planning tips. What are the different things that you want to do? You want to develop really simple goals. And it could be something as simple as having five new members this year, or 100% of your membership working on a community service activity. Maybe they can't all go to an event, but at least everyone take part in the activity. And what you want to do is brainstorm with your group and get different ideas and get be sure every member is contributing. And there's different ways that you can do that. And we'll talk about some of those a little later on. After your brainstorming, you're going to choose what you want to do and you're going to make a plan. You want to make sure that your plan is balanced and that there is some flexibility there. You wanna have fun things. You wanna have some service options. You wanna have educational programs. You wanna use committees. Let the youth work in committees. That way they can tackle different jobs and learn how to work with each other in that committee structure. Because I know as adults, we constantly are working in a committee where each person has different roles and different things that they need to do and commitments that they make to that committee because they're on it. And then lastly, you want to be able to adjust your plan and make those adjustments as you needed. For example, last year when we started all of our clubs, we thought it would be a regular year and then COVID hit and we had to go to a virtual arena and deliver everything virtually, which is why you're with us tonight, because we needed to adapt and change and make changes to move on. So here, we're just gonna briefly talk about parts of the club meeting. There are three basic parts. You have the business meeting, which is the part that most of you think of. It's got the officers, they call the meeting to order. Um, you have committees, you do your reports, you decide how you're spending your club funds and that sort of thing. Now, do you have to do that every week? No. Do you have to do that every month? Well, we would encourage you to do at least the business part of the meeting once a month. But if you meet more often and do more things, that's okay. You can rotate it. Also, there's an educational program. And that's going to be about 50% of your time. This could be speeches and demos. It could be sh show and tell. It could be tours. It could be activities. It could be videos. It could be guest speakers, all of those things. And then the last 25% is recreation. Just letting your youth have fun. Letting them sing songs, play games, do team building activities, maybe have a refreshment. Um, if you're doing that now, though, you need to take special precautions um, due to COVID. Over here, you'll see the club plans and meeting plans, and it just breaks everything out. And this is in that club planning guide that you saw a couple of slides before, right here. 4-H club planning workbook. 
again, there are more resources for you, the scripts, things to do at the Northwest District Volunteer Site, as well as the Military Partnership Site. The Military Partnership Site, if you have really young youth and you want to allow them to have the opportunity to try different offices, there is a rotation guide and you can have everybody um, design a um, clothespin and rotate that clothespin around so everybody gets a chance to try the different roles. You could have the different roles in a cup and they pull a popsicle stick out and that's their role for the day. Um, there's also club meeting scripts that'll go through and script out your meeting for your officers so they're not challenged by running a meeting. And they kind of get the idea of, of how to run a meeting, how to do pledges, what 4-H pledge is, and that sort of thing. For designing your own clover, this is another um, item that you can use. It's a great tool to use for generating ideas. On the design your own clover, it asks four different questions. What I would like to know more about, learn more about, how we could help our community, for fun we could do what, and some things that I would just like to do. And so these are different ways that you can generate ideas at the beginning of your club sessions um, and or in the midway through to finish out your year and develop your club plan. Your club plan, you may do an annual club plan. You may do a quarterly club plan. It really depends on how often you meet. If you're meeting once a month, you're probably gonna put together an annual club plan. If you're meeting like once a week, then you may do a quarterly club plan. So there is some flexibility there, but you do wanna have a plan of attack. Okay, during the pandemic, I have had the privilege of um, doing some professional development through the Military Partnership Program. And Jones Laughlin has been doing trainings for us and helping us set our goals and, and look at our lives and things that we can manage. And that's what I'm sharing, all of us are gonna share with you tonight. Um, really, there are five things that we can manage. Um, and those are energy, focus, relationships, choices, and schedules. And we're going to talk about each of those. If you are looking for some professional growth and development, I, I really like Jones Laughlin. In fact, I've got one of his books right here that I am uh, reading and going through on the always growing. I have some of my coworkers tell me that the juggling elephants one is an excellent one to do. So there are several options there. And then there's a YouTube video that goes through the time management. So if you want to go a little bit more in depth, the five things you can manage, um, that will help you. Another person that um, we learned about was Daniel Pink. And he wrote the book, When, The Scientific Secrets of Perfect Timing. And he talks about your energy level and that energy is both mental, physical, and emotional. And those activities can be both energizing and draining. He says that 75% of us wake up in the morning at our peak, we feel our best, and then we'll trough during the day and he says about 255 is when we really hit our low for 75% of us. And then we'll rebound again in the evening. Then there's another 25% of us. And unfortunately, I'm in that 25%. You start in recovery mode. And then you'll kind of trough out just like the peak performance. And then you're going to peak in the evening. So know your strengths. Know when to do your deep thinking and your deep uh, activities, activities that require more mental and emotional things, 
during your peak time so that you have more energy to tackle those things that are a little more challenging. Another thing he talks about is removing distractions. And he says the best way to do this is by doing a focus audit. Looking at your desk, if it's like this, which could easily be my desk for many of you that know me, um, there are way too many distractions there. And so you want to eliminate those distractions so that it doesn't call your attention away. You don't go off on tangents or chasing squirrels, as one of my coworkers says. She tickles me. She says, ah, squirrel, she's chasing a squirrel again. Um, you also want to evaluate things that affect your other senses, such as your, what you're hearing, things that you smell, things that you could be touching, things that you're tasting. All of those different things can help focus you or unfocus you depending on what they are. I had someone tell me once, Dr. Paula, that um, I don't have my ducks in a row. I have squirrels and they're everywhere. <laughs> Do you feel like that sometimes? <laughs> Whoa, <laughs> I think everybody feels that way. Sometimes. The squirrel just hit. Oh, it did. Okay. So as Dr. Paula was saying, um, one of the things that we can manage are our relationships, the relationships we do have in our lives. And as uh, Laughlin says, there are three types of people. There are the fillers in the world. There are the drainers in the world. And then there are those types of people that are just there in our lives. And so we need to be mindful of those three different types of people and who we let into our lives and who we allow to stay. So definitely in order to be successful and those that don't um, suck the time out of our schedule, we need to have the fillers. Those that fill our time and our schedule and help us to be successful. Um, so we want those that are fillers. We wanna surround ourselves with those that are fillers, those that help us and help us to be successful. So that is the relationship. Those are the people that we look for. And also those are the type of people that we want to be for others. We also want others to be successful. So we need to be the fillers, not only in our own lives, but in the lives of others as well. We need to avoid the drainers, um, stay away from those, those that are negative and those that will help pull you down. You need to make sure you stay away from those and block those out of your lives. And those that are just there, um, they're taking up space. They're using your oxygen. So you just need to um, avoid those as well. So always surround yourself with those individuals that are your fillers. They're the ones that are gonna make you happy and help you to be successful. Okay, Dr. Paula, next slide. I was gonna say the other thing too is that we all have drainers um, that we have to deal with. And that's understandable, but put those in when you've got your higher energy levels, not at your lowest energy level, because you don't want to be at a low point and then go even lower. So be sure that um, when you are, know you've got to deal with a drainer, do it at a higher peak energy time. That's a very good point, an excellent point. And we often hear ourselves saying, and we have other people saying to us that people come into our lives for a season, a reason, or sometimes a lifetime. And so we need to know the difference. Um, people are placed in our lives for various reasons. Um, so we need to recognize that and utilize their strengths um, for when we are maybe at a weak point and um, offer um, your assistance when somebody's at a weak point, but be willing to accept help when you need help and ask for help when you need help, um, but be willing to give your help and your strength when somebody's down. Um, that's what makes um, not only a great leader, but also makes a strong team. So um, utilize your time wisely, recognize those relationships around you and utilize your strengths to your benefit, but the benefit of others. Um, that's what makes strong relationships. The other thing that we can manage is our choices. When you're making a choice, try and respond instead of reacting. And I'm guilty of reacting quite often too, but I have gotten better about taking that deep breath, give myself a little bit of time to think because, and I really love this that Jones Laughlin said, he said, if I say yes to this, 
what am I saying no to? Because we only have 24 hours in the day. So before you say yes, or that you will do this, be sure that you're not giving up something that you really want to do because you can only say yes to so much. You've only got 24 hours in a day and part of that time you need to sleep. That's right. And again, going back to what you can control and what you cannot control, remember that you cannot control time, but you can control your schedule. So that is why um, time uh, management, control, learning to control your schedule is very important. And learning tools to effectively manage your time is what is so important. So the benefits to learning how to schedule your time and time management, it contributes to your overall health. It increases productivity and helps you to be successful. And when you are healthy and you're in a good place, you have balance in your life and you're, you feel successful and you feel productive in your own life, it offers benefits not only to you, but to your family and friends, those that are around you. Um, it offers benefits and success to your workplace and um, the organizations in which you serve and your own community. So there are a lot of great benefits to learning how to manage your time successfully. So tonight we're going to share with you some of the best tools that we know as professionals for you volunteers and those of you that work within the 4-H programs with us to help you to learn how to manage your time. And we hope that you adopt at least one of the tools that we're gonna share with you tonight, um, that you use it not only in your 4-H programs and your club management, but also maybe in your personal and your professional lives and help you to reach that success of feeling balanced and successful. So some of the tools that we're gonna share with you tonight, the 80-20 rule, the slice and dice, learning how to block your schedule, the drop dead list, the, using your A, B, C, and Ds, and learning how to refine, refine, and refine. So the 80-20 rule in practice, it sounds like it's complicated, but it's actually quite simple. If you think about it, if you use just 20% of your time to produce 80% of your successes, so that is the 80-20 uh, rule. So if, it, if you knock it down to just this, if you have a list of 10 items, two, possibly three at the very most are gonna be your most important items on the list that turn out to be of the most value and the most success to you. So with the 80-20 rule, you want to look at the list and the two or three items on the list, you wanna give 20% of your time to get 80% of your successes. So that is the 80-20 rule. So think about that. You got 10 items on your list. Look at your list. What are the two or three items that are the most vital to you and spend that time, 20% of your time to get the most reward out of the time that you spend. Quite simple when you break it down, the 80-20 rule. All right. And the next is the slice and dice. So we can't eat an elephant all at once. We can only eat an elephant one bite at a time or pizza or whatever. Pizza works well because this looks like a pizza. So you can only eat your pizza one bite at a time. You can't eat the whole pie at once. So for the slice and dice method, what you wanna do is prioritize and break down that big task into smaller tasks. And then go ahead and complete one of those tasks because that means you've started. You're on the way to getting this project done. You have made that commitment and you've started out. And it always feels good when you can knock something off, mark it off that list. And so you'll cross it off and move on and then schedule the different parts later on in your scheduling. And we'll talk about how to block schedule and do some of that in a little bit. So the next one is using your A, B, C, and Ds. And um, you're gonna hear us say prioritize quite a bit in the next um, few slides. So using your A, B, C, and Ds, I like this one because it's actually very simple. There's very few rules to this. And if nothing else tonight, uh, this is quite simple for you to use. Um, just remember A, B, C, and D. So it's 
taking your to-do list, writing everything that you have to do or you feel like you have to do down on a list and then looking at it and prioritizing what you need to get done and then going back and assigning it A, B, C, or D. Assign each task A, B, C, or D and by assigning it, assign it a category. Either A, it's a thing you must get done or B, it's something you should get done. C, something you feel mm, it would be nice to get it done. Or D, it is something that you could delegate to get done and you would feel good about delegating it to get it done. And when it's done, it's done. So go through your list, prioritize it, and then categorize it, get, assign it, A, B, C, or D. It's as simple as that. And then when you learn to do this, you can take this tool and apply it to what Dr. Paula is about to tell you. So one of the tools that I really like to use are schedule blocks or blocking my schedule. So you have your personal time, which is like for exercise, reading, meditation, that sort of thing, um, learning, any of those things, just things that you can do. Then you've got your strategic time. This is when you review your goals, you prioritize what you're going to do, you assess your progress. So that's where you would use that ABCD that Nikki just talked about is during the strategic time. Then you have administrative time. And this is where you check your emails and either queue it, or if it's an immediate that you can knock it out, you get it knocked out and um, look at what reports you need to do and the little things that take like 15 to 30 minutes. Then you've got phone and email time. And um, during this time, you're actually doing responses. It's not looking at emails. It's actually doing the responses. If you couldn't handle it immediately, it was something that was going to take a while or a phone call that's, you know, you need to talk to people and work through different things. It's going to take more than two minutes to do. Then you have a block for that. Then you have your relationship time. These are intentional interactions with others. This can be family time. It can be time with your coworkers. I know at work, we often like to have either lunch or snack together just to talk how the day's going, how the family's doing, what's going on, um, how Melanie's doing in soccer, how the girls are doing in majorettes. You know, we just kind of touch base. How the ones that have left home, what they're into and what they're doing now, that sort of thing. And then there's deep work time. And this is when you want to tackle those complex tasks. They take more than 30 minutes. And this is a time where you get to be creative. You get to take on those tasks that are a little more complex. You want to be sure that you've removed all of those issues that take away from your focus. and have some time slated on your calendar for deep work. And you can kind of see this is a paper calendar with things kind of slated out. So after I statements are, uh, it's a tool that can be used to uh, start a new behavior and um, make it a habit. So after I statements, um, they're a great way to set goals, simple statements. Um, for example, uh, after I finish a call, I will take three to five minutes to capture my thoughts and schedule things to be done. Um, if you actually set this statement and remind yourself to do it, it helps to create a habit. It helps you to create a behavior and you will stick to it. So after I statements, they could be two or three. You can have just one but it helps you to set a behavior and become consistent with it. So this is a great way to implement some of these tools that we're talking about. Uh, you may have one, you may have three, but go ahead and set you an after I statement and this will help you to create uh, your behavior and get it started. Yeah, the after I statement I'm using is I'll do 15 minutes of exercise when I get up in the morning to get my body going because when I get up in the morning, I am in recovery mode, so I need to do something to get some energy going. So starting a new behavior. Um, 
a habit expert from Stanford University shares his breakthrough method for building habits quickly and easily. And it's BJ Fogg and it's called Tiny Habits. And he talks about the map technique. And what that is, is motivation, the ability or capacity to, it, to engage, and then a prompt or putting systems in place to actually accomplish the task. And so if you're interested in creating some new habits, you know that's something that you need to do, I would um, recommend this book. It's a great book to help. So there's an old saying that says, if you want something done, just ask a busy person. And that is so true. So um, you need to surround yourself with um, people that get things done and um, learn from them. So key questions that you can ask yourself is, who can I team up with to get results? How can I build more effective teams? Who should be paired up on the team for best results? And then easily the who, what, when, where, why, and how. So again, one of the themes through tonight has been, who do I surround myself with to pick up some of their skills and their tools to help make me successful as well? All right, and we will be sharing a link for J.D. Meyer where a lot of these uh, time management tips came from. There it's list, a long list of different things, but these are ones that kind of hit for us as volunteers and as agents. Um, one thing that he talked about was calculating your fluff time to make adjustments. And the way you do that is you copy down everything you do all day for a week on your schedule. And then you look at those areas that aren't really your priority. You're just spinning your wheels and taking time out of your schedule and identify those fluff moments so you can make some adjustments to your time. Then the next is to adopt at least one new time management tool or schedule management tool or habit management, whatever you need to work on. Um, I like this one too, which is put on an app on your phone to capture your notes and ideas. It could be a voice recorded app. It could be one where you're dropping in your notes or if you like to handwrite, which I do a lot of times, um, take a notebook with you where you can just keep accumulating things so you don't lose those things that you're thinking of and you don't have to try and store them in your head. I know my memory's getting a little shorter now, especially since the pandemic. I, it seems to keep shrinking. So it really helps me to capture things either in a notebook or on my phone. And I'll be honest, a lot of times I write it in my notebook and then I take a picture of it. So if I misplace my notebook, I've still got it. The next thing they talked about was learning how to scan, find what's important and focus on those important items. And then another one was to make minor decisions quickly. Don't spend $20 on a $5 problem. And I'm guilty of this. Quite often, I, I think I need to think about something before I make a decision. But many times, is the decision going to really matter two days from now? If it's a no, then don't spend a lot of time on it. Make the decision and move on. Yes, I agree. And I'm old fashioned too. I like to write things down. So um, if you don't like to carry a notepad, but you do like to write things down, um, the Galaxy Note, uh, if you're an Apple user uh, on your phone, but you know you like to write things down, consider a phone that you know you can use one of those pens or a Galaxy Note because um, you can still write it down and save it and then it's in your phone. So um, there are new technologies out there um, that still you know let you use pen and paper, but it's actually in your, in your phone now. So there's ways out there that you can bring it back up to technology and uh, it still makes you happy. So um, some more tips, uh, set 30 minutes a day um, at the, either the beginning of the day to get you through the day, or if you're ready for tomorrow, set it at the end of the day dedicated for planning. This really helps you to be successful. Um, also include an attitude of gratitude. It can really set your day off in a positive way. So an attitude of gratitude, whether it's a note, it can be a note to yourself. 
It can be an email, um, but make sure that you start it off in a positive way. It's really a great way to get you going. And then starting and finishing something within the first hour of the day to build a sense of accomplishment. How many of us love to scratch something off our to-do list and it just makes us feel so good to be able to scratch it? Um, I'm one of these that I like to make sure everything is scratched off my to-do list before I start another to-do list because it's a sense of accomplishment when everything is scratched off. I feel like I've really accomplished something. So start your day with something that you know you can get done in that first beginning part so that you can scratch it off and go, I really got something accomplished. That builds your day up and gets you going. And then use a calendar to block time for deep thinking. Just like Dr. Paula said, getting that deep thinking on your calendar and um, not starting off with the small minor things, but that deep thinking, put your mind in a set to get you going and get you in that right frame of mind for what you may have to tackle. So it's very important to block your schedule for the time you need for thinking and accomplishing, accomplishing what has to get done. You've got to make sure your frame of mind is where it needs to be to accomplish some of the things you have to face throughout the day. Which brings up the mindfulness that we studied earlier in the year. And there are some apps, some gratitude apps and journaling apps that help as well when we were talking about technology. So there's some different things that you can do that which make it nice and some fun things too, some games and that kind of thing. So you've received most of your resources in the chat, but here are some of our resources. And we are just so excited that you have spent time, taken time out of your schedule and block time to be with us this evening. Absolutely. And we do encourage you to join us again in May. On May 20th, uh, we have uh, some more presenters that will uh, talk about parenting, uh, recruit, parent recruitment and engagement, they're going to delve into how to get parents involved in your club planning and uh, club management, how to delegate those responsibilities to youth and adult volunteers, uh, so that way you have much more engagement within your programming, and uh, so we have some great topics for you. And remember, we have that resource page through the Northwest District uh, Volunteer website, that you can find so many infographics, so many fact sheets, um, videos. We have a lot uh, for you on the website, so be sure to visit that um, for anything that you may need. Um, we've dropped that in the chat several times, and uh, we hope that those tools are really helpful for you. Thank you all so much for joining us. Again, visit both the Northwest District and the Military Partnership website. If you get a chance today, Take your purple, take a picture, post it, showing you support military kids. We are so excited about our military youth. They're so courageous. I mean, they deal with all kinds of different situations and we would appreciate you showing support for the military youth and wear purple. If you can't do it today, do it tomorrow or the next day. Just purple up, show your support for military kids. Have a great night. Yes, thank you for joining us. Have a good evening.